So you spoke today here at the Government 2.0 Summit uh, about UnityNet uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about what that will mean towards information sharing? Well, we're looking at leveraging the power of the Internet as a disruptive force for good. If you think about oppressive regimes, and we're still battling an enemy there in Afghanistan, they seek to limit freedom of speech and access to the outside world. So if we can get the Afghans connected to the Internet, so that they can discover each other, share and collaborate on topics of common interest, as well as reach out to the broader international community that's essentially standing by, ready to support them, similar to the response we saw with the crowdsourcing following the Haiti earthquake. Uh, we believe that that will better inform them to make better decisions for their own government stabilities, socioeconomic benefits as well. <laughs> so what's the state of uh connectivity and communications infrastructure there now? <laughs> it really depends. Mm -hmm. In the capital city, you'll see more connectivity. We have fiber laid in. There's, there's satellite bandwidth that can be leveraged anywhere pretty much in the country. And then you have cellular communications. But some of the things that we're dealing with in some areas, the Taliban will shut down the cellular communications overnight. And so that's where the Wi-Fi networks that we can establish by maybe uh, connecting via SATCOM to the internet and building the local Wi-Fi allow people to at least collaborate within a region until maybe their network or cellular com connectivity comes up uh, the next morning. So what kind of Wi-Fi networks are we talking about here? Well we're looking to build uh, procure hardware that you can get locally in Afghanistan. And so in some cases, we've leveraged uh, what MIT has done with our FabFi. Hmm. And so you can take plywood and chicken wire and build some kind of antenna uh, for a signal. And then trying to leverage as much as possible free and open source software. The goal here is a leave behind capability. So we can set it up, teach them how to leverage it. And then ultimately, when we pull out, that's something that they can s sustain after we're gone. Does that then uh, bring back to power generation issues too? I mean, I've certainly had experienced blackouts, <laughs> and that's a uh, fact of life there. Absolutely. So in some areas, we probably have shelter and power, and we can jack into the wall like we know here in America to get to the Internet. In other areas, we're definitely an austere environment, and that's where the power of leveraging with natural def Finch University has done with their star tides, where they have been responding for years in post-disaster situations, helping people get on their feet. And to that end, they found innovative solutions for the shelter, the water purification, providing power, as well as IT and communications infrastructure. So we're bonusing off the solutions they've already done for places like Haiti and Pakistan after the floodings and others to leverage here in Afghanistan. Um, you know, is it just about Wi-Fi? Are there mesh networks involved here? Yes. Okay. Um, and so it's essentially leverage, leveraging the same kinds of technology you'd see in the one laptop per child uh, or Meraki you'd see in Cambridge, et cetera. Um, what about um, the issue of uh, fault tolerance there? Because again, um, you're dealing in an area where you have a fairly hostile uh, adversary who would, uh, specifically would not want to get information sharing uh, within the public uh, or within the larger world. Um, what's the concern in terms of um, building up nodes in the network so that it's more distributed. Uh, is, is that part of the plan? What's the yes. strategy there? Absolutely. So we have an idea where there'll be local nodes in a region, say Jalalabad, for example, Nangahar province. And part of our going in position is while some people will say, for example, you know, why do you need to use OpenStreetMaps or you need other imagery data, you've got Google Earth. Well, when you're disconnected to the, from the internet, you can't use that. And so we're making sure that we have data and tools that when people are disconnected and only working locally, it's useful. They can continue to leverage that data, add information, and then when they have the connectivity again, they'll sync with a what we would call a hub node. So we're doing a hub and sub node kind of architecture. So ultimately, you can take the area in a region and, and then build an aggregate picture across the country. Now, one of the uh, other side issues then, if once you provide connectivity, is end user devices. Um, what, what kind of um, uh, connectivity uh, opportunities are there in, uh, in Kabul or, or beyond in terms of uh, penetration uh, for any kinds of, of laptops, cell phones, et cetera? I mean, kind of what's the starting point there, and how would you address that challenge? 
That's a really good point. So we're looking at leveraging computers, whether wired or wireless, as well as the mobile devices. Because in a lot of cases where people don't have direct access to the internet, they do have the cellular connection. They're doing SMSing, and one of the pictures I had is you know the women using their cell phones to take pictures and, and do those kind of updates. So the idea is, is that we'll leverage, regardless of what device somebody is coming from, be able to bridge them into this collaborative environment where they can contribute information as well as query those data holdings and retrieve that in real time wherever they might be. And uh, you mentioned open source. Why use uh, open source uh, commodity hardware versus, um, say, more ruggedized equipment or that's proprietary but has been designed to deal with more extreme environments, which Afghanistan is mm -hmm. certainly replete with? Well, it, again, it comes back to sustainability. DOD so many times in the past has come in and we have our very elaborate, very expensive systems that have the high O&M tails where they're licensing fees or, or recap. And the idea here, and this is something where the International Security Assistance Force head of Intel said, we really need to leave behind solutions. And so when you do a design, do something with the Afghans in mind. This is something that once we make the investment, that they can leverage it when we're gone. And so the beauty of open source is not only the free tools that are out there, but the open source tools that they can use offline, that they can tailor, they can build their own platform. And so teaching them how to harness those capabilities, then there won't be that issue in the out years of, well, we don't have the funds to continue this. Plus, this amazing open source community that is so very collaborative, like the OpenStreetMaps community, that is standing by as we're working to get data released to do mapping parties and update information in various regions in Afghanistan. So in terms of, of looking um, at where there have been successes in this kinds of approach in the past, where are the lessons learned that you all drawing from? Well, one thing we uh, learned from talking with private volunteers and others in the area who've been successful is um, there has been a shift, whereas before there wasn't a willingness to share against, uh, amongst all the different parties, is they're realizing in stability operations, we're all in this together. And so people are more willingly sharing information about security with DOD, for example. But in a lot of cases, people will have no association with DOD or the U.S. government and the military. And that's a safety issue, a reputation issue, just perception issue. And so we're leveraging people who are essentially bridgers who are comfortable working with the government side and also with the very non-traditional partners whose information, you know, in their heads and their spiral notebooks and their disconnected computers is critical to the success of this effort. And so we're also defaulting to, well, if we can eliminate the barrier to entry, if we can get you connected, essentially provide that capability free of charge. And also, everybody, a picture's worth a thousand words. So many people working in an area, if they can have a detailed map or an image of an area that is hugely valuable to them, so if we eliminate the barrier of entry, share with them first, then they'll share back with us. That's essentially the, the premise. <laughs> mm. And uh, last question. Uh, one of the challenges in um, autocracies, repressive regimes, well, with respect to information technology and creating networks can be that by using them, you identify yourself as someone um, who may be of interest to that regime. Uh, how do you prevent the very network itself being used against the people um, that are populating it? Well, it's interesting, an example of uh, Afghanistan election monitoring that occurred last year. Technically, people weren't officially allowed to do that, but they set up uh, a mechanism via SMS using Ushahidi, where the people, the private volunteers who were collecting information from everyone across the country could know, I would know that you actually sent that information to me, but I could mask the source as I work to populate that on the map. So we have mechanisms to protect the source while still sharing the information. Okay. Well, thank you for talking a bit more about UnityNet. Is there a place where people can learn more online? Well, if you look at Fixing Intel, that's available online. That's one of the drivers on it. And we also have a white paper that's been published um, in open source as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.